Hello everybody and welcome to English Gems video on Frankenstein. Today I'm going to be looking at chapter five and I'm going to be talking you through what to look for when you're reading any novel and kind of the key tips, key pointers and hopefully chapter five is an incredibly important chapter in Frankenstein. Uh, if you follow this, if you're studying Frankenstein for GCSE or A level, you need to get yourself a good copy. This is mine, as you can see. It's well worn, well used, but it's the best way to revise and the best way to read. And what happens is then you'll realize that I have completely annotated. So all my key themes are there. I'm color coordinated with characters and themes and everything. Everything is annotated and filled in which makes it really good for when you come to revise. My students have always really enjoyed doing this. They then really understand in a lot of depth and all their notes are in one place. They just got to reread it and their revision is done because everything is there. So if you're really serious about getting those good grades, get yourself a copy of the text and make some annotations. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's make a start. Let's share my screen with you. Here we go. So a bit of close reading to begin with, looking at how do I annotate, what is it that I'm looking for when I'm reading, and what are the key things that I really need to remember when I'm looking at, not just Frankenstein, but any of the core literature text. And that's essentially where we're going to go today. So, just going to let me start. There we go. Slight panic. So here's what we need to look for. The most important things when we're reading is identifying not just who the characters are, but what they are like. Who are they as a person? Yes, we can say we've got Frankenstein, we've got the creature, with all of these characters, but actually we need to kind of know them. You need to get to know them as if they're real and you really do know and understand what their personalities are like. And that all comes across from the behavior, how they speak, what people say about them to characters and really understanding your characters is one of the most important things, as is setting. Setting, it sets the scene, it sets up everything that you're going to need to know. And obviously here we have Gothic literature. So our setting needs to be Gothic. We need thunder and lightning and rain and dismal winter, bleary weather, because we have that pathetic fallacy, we have that miserable mood, we're creating life from dead body parts. It's not going to be all sunny and rainbows. So the setting, choice is always another thing you should be talking about. Then we move on to the themes, what themes come across, so the power of nature or science, mankind, who is a big power struggle in here. We've got the idea of that paternal, that Frankenstein actually just disregards the monster. Um, the creature as soon as he's created it, but actually he's technically the parent. He should be taking responsibility for that. Is he the one to blame for everything that happens? And they're the themes that we can then discuss. These groups are always really, really important because you want to be learning some key quotes that link to the themes, the setting, the characters. And if you can get quotes that link to the themes, the setting, the characters, you're covering more bases that when you go into the exam, you've got a bank of quotes that you know really well that link to everything that you can really analyze. And as always, upgrades, writer's purpose, why are they doing this? What are they trying to teach us? What are the reactions to this? And are there alternative interpretations? And that's where we're going if we want to be going towards the top. Just to talk you through how to uh, begin really annotating your text. So this example that I've got, which is from the start of chapter five, we're looking really at the setting and the language that's used here to create this atmosphere, because this is the moment that the creature comes to life. And you'll notice that in the yellow, I've highlighted anything that links to the setting. So we have obviously have Gothic, dreary nights, we've got the really bad weather, we've got November, November is known as a very dull month, nothing particularly exciting happens in November, it's winter, it's dark, it's miserable, so it's a nice setting to choose for the awakening of a creature. 
We then have the fact that it's one o'clock in the morning. And again, with this gothic hat on, we're thinking, well, that's about the right time for when all the ghoulies come out and bad things seem to happen in the middle of the night. So it needs to be happening in the night. To add to that, then she's got it raining and the rain pattering dismally. So everything is creating this sad mood. The candle's nearly burnt out. So again, the setting of where we are, he's only got a little bit of light left that creates this setting of like, he's got limited time before he's not gonna be able to see anything. And all of those things start to come together to bring a picture. And then we have Lexis, language, words, that are being used here to describe some of the characters. So we have um, Frankenstein here, Victor, who's described as, as an anxiety that almost amounts to agony. So here, he, he's, it's like he's been doing this, as we know. He, he hasn't slept for days. He's not well, but he can't stop. He has to achieve his goal. So he keeps going, but he's anxious now. He's at that point. This is it. This has got to happen. So the tension starts to increase. We then have this word life, which I've highlighted because I feel a bit like this is what he's doing. He is creating life. And that's quite important. And then we have this creation of life into a lifeless thing. And we'll notice, obviously, I'm hoping you know why the creature was never given a name. And he's referred to as this thing that lay at his feet. Now, this thing is something he really wanted to create. He's been working really, really hard for a very long time on this. And it's just a thing, it's an object, it's like it's nothing to him. And then we have the eye open, the dull yellow eye of the creature opens, which we reference to later on in chapter five. And then it breathing hard, the convulsive motion. So this idea that it's like got convulsions, it's agitated. So obviously, if you think of like you're giving it life, it's going to do that. It's going to be shaking, it's going to be coming to life. But he takes that in the wrong way and reacts quite negatively to it, which is the biggest problem. As you can see here, we're just going through, and that's all I have in my text. We've just got annotations of settings, characters, keynotes, keywords. So what I'm going to do as I'm reading through this, let me just those. There we go. There we go. I'm going to have um, a little bit of a read because it's always nice to have someone to read to you. I'm going to read a little bit of chapter five, not all of it, because we'll be here all day. And I'm hoping that as you follow and listen, if you're studying Frankenstein, you'll really get some understanding or deeper understanding from listening to where I'm adding my annotations. So we're getting serious, putting the old lady glasses on. Here we go. It was a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes and my candle was nearly burned out when, by the glimmer of a half extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? Catastrophe, so we've got an instant dislike here. This is horrific. Well, he's been working on this for ages. How can it be horrific? This should be amazing for him. So it shows the instant dislike and hatred that he has towards what he's done. Or how, then not it, the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I have endeavoured to form. His limbs were in proportion and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful! Great God! And there we have our religious reference of talking to God. Oh my goodness, what on earth have I done? So he realises here that he's made that mistake. He thought he was creating something that was beautiful. But the moment it starts to move, it suddenly dawns on him that this is not beautiful. The exclamation mark there is kind of emphasizing that this is not at all beautiful. Great God, exclamation mark. 
to hear his created life and we then have a description of the creature is very much like a newborn baby so we have yellow skin which scarcely covered the work of muscles and arches beneath his hair was of a lustrous black gothic has to be black and flowing his teeth of a pearly whiteness but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. The different accidents of life are not so changeable as the feelings of human nature. I had worked hard for nearly two years for the sole purpose of infusing life into an inanimate body. For this I had deprived myself of rest and health. I had desired it with an ardor that far exceeded moderation. But now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Really good quote there. So the moment this creature comes to life, he realizes that he's been agonizing over creating it for all this time. And then we have that breathless horror and complete disgust filling my heart. There's an instant emotional connection that he feels like he's repelled away from what he's created. Now, if he were responsible, he'd do something about that. But we're trying to make this argument that perhaps scientists aren't particularly that responsible during this time. We're afraid of science at this time. So obviously, what's the scientist, irresponsible scientist going to do? Run in the other direction. So here we go. And able to enjoy the aspect of the being I had created, I rushed out of the room and continued a long time traversing my bedchamber, unable to compose my mind to sleep. At length, lassitude succeeded to tumult, and I had before endured. I threw myself on the bed in my clothes, endeavouring to seek a few moments of forgetfulness. Yeah, right. But I was in vain. I slept, indeed, but I was disturbed by the wildest dreams. I thought I saw Elizabeth in the bloom of health, walking in the streets of Ingolstadt. Delighted and surprised, I embraced her. But as I imprinted the first kiss on her lips, they became livid with the hue of death. Her features appeared to change, and I thought that I held the corpse of my dead mother in my arms. Okay, how instantly dark has this got? The creature's just been created. He's run off and left it. No one knows where it is or what it's doing. He's having a little sleep, and then suddenly, we, don't, we have this foreshadowing of death. So the hue of death, so she's surrounded by this hue of death. This idea that is this a dream, is this reality? Well, a lot of people die, so we can foreshadow that something is to come. And then we have this horrible image of his dead mother in his arms. And it's, why the mother? Well, a mother is what creates life. The mother, mother nature creates life, women, mothers, can create life and he's killed a mother figure now if we want really top grades here we want to think about in order for him to create life because he's going to be that first person that's created life without the need for a female we've got reproduction here of him suddenly going well women are no longer needed i don't need a woman i've just created life there we go and we have this image of his dead mother in his arms right there. And that's your high order thinking of interpretations of why his mother don't need women anymore. A shroud enveloped her form and I saw the grave worms crawling in the folds of the flannel. I started from my sleep with horror. A cold dew covered my forehead. My teeth chattered. Notice, he now sounds like the creature when it woke up. Every limb became convulsed when by the dim yellow light of the moon, remember the creature had the yellow eye, so there seems to be a big resemblance between him waking up and the creature waking up. It forced its way through the window shutters and I beheld the wretch, the miserable monster whom I had created. He held up the curtain of the bed and his eyes if eyes they may be called, cool, were fixed on me. Well, you're his parent. You just brought him into the world. 
When babies are born, they look for their mother. When animals are born, they look for their mother. This creature is looking for its parent. It's found it. It's going to look at him. But Victor doesn't see it in that way. His jaws opened and he muttered some inarticulate sounds while a grin wrinkled his cheeks. He might have spoken, but I didn't hear. One hand was stretched out, seemingly to detain me. Brilliant, I love this quote. So we've got this image here of this monster that's been convulsing, that's come up, it's staring at him. Description is so gothic that we should be afraid of this creature. And he is, but for the wrong reasons, because there's a different image here. What Victor sees, or what he describes here, is that it stretches out a hand. Now we've got this image of stretching out a hand as if it's gonna grab him, it's gonna grab his throat, it's gonna detain him. So he needs help, he needs to escape. It's going to kill me. In his head, I'm not a fan of Victor, you might realize this, he then is like, oh, this is all, it's gonna kill me, it tried to attack me, this is awful. Well, actually, we look at this again in a different way. It just says that one hand was stretched out. Now, if we've got life just been created, we've got a creature that cannot speak. It doesn't know where it is. It doesn't know what's happened to it. It sees its creator and it stretches out a hand. The chances are it's asking for help. It's not trying to detain and kill. It's, it's asking is asking for help because it can't speak. But Victor doesn't see that. And so he assumes that it's going to detain him. And I escaped and rushed downstairs. Brilliant. I took refuge in the courtyard belonging to the house which I inhabited, where I remained during the rest of the night, walking up and down in the greatest agitation, listening attentively, catching and fearing each sound as if it were to approach the demonical corpse to which I had so miserably given life. Oh, no mortal could support the horror of that countenance. A mummy again endued with animation could be so hideous as that wretch. Hold on a minute. This was something that you created because you thought it was beautiful. Leave the creature alone. We're banging on here about how horrific it is. You made it look like that. I'm not a Victor fan, I know I've already said that. So we've got this mummy, this animation, nothing can be here. And we have, I gazed on him while unfinished. He was ugly then, but when the muscles and joints were rendered capable of motion, as soon as it could move, it became such as even Dante could not have conceived. Now Dante was a poet at the time, um, and he wrote about hell, which is a bit taboo because we're very, very religious. And this person is probably going to be going to hell. So it's interesting there's a reference to hell here um, and that's what the creature is creating. He thinks that this creature is going to hell when really the creature hasn't done anything wrong. It's an innocent victim in this at the moment. So the only one going to hell would be Victor. I passed the night wretchedly. Sometimes my pulse beat so quickly and hardly that I felt a palpitation in every artery. At others, I nearly sank to the ground to the languor and extreme weakness. Mingled with this horror, I felt the bitterness of disappointment. Dreams that had been my food and pleasant rest for so long a space were now become a hell to me. Repetition of hell. The change was so rapid, the overthrow so complete. I'm just gonna do a tiny bit more. Morning, dismal and wet. So again, weather, mood, miserable, gothic, it's like it hasn't changed from the evening. Dawn discovered to my sleepless, aching eyes the church of Ingolstadt, its white steeple and clock which indicated the sixth hour. The porter opened the gates of the court which had that night been my asylum. Well, this isn't, his, he calls it an asylum now, somewhere where he's kind of been trapped and forced to be, that's horrific, like a prison. Well, up until last night, he chose to be there and chose to spend his time there, chose to ignore his family, chose to ignore everybody. It wasn't an asylum then, but this is what it now becomes to him. I issued into the streets, pacing them with quick steps as if I sought to avoid the wretch whom I feared every turning of the street would present to my view. I did not dare return to the apartment which I inhabited, but 
felt impelled to hurry on, although drenched by the rain which poured from a black and comfortless sky. And there we go, essentially, we have a reference further on to his hand. And I could happily read this forever, but as if you want me to, that was me just giving you a little taster, really, of how we should be reading these novels for literature and what we should be looking for and what we should be annotating as we're going through, learning about the characters. We've learned a lot about Victor there, of his, how irresponsible he is. We've learned a lot about the creature there. And the last slide that I'm going to show you, we're just gonna talk ever so quickly through what it is you would then do at this point. So if I just pop that one back up for you, can I do it? So I've got this information, I've read, I've read it, now what do I do? What am I supposed to do from here? Well, we then have to go back through those chapters when we've read them and think about getting our key quotes. And then we've got to analyze them because that's where we're going to be getting those marks. So I've taken the quote here, beautiful, beautiful exclamation mark, which I talked about as we were reading, and great God, and the reference to religion with the reference to God, and that he's created life, he's playing God. And now it's like, oh, whoops, and it's, he's blaming somebody else. So there's loads in that quote that you can pick. If we then think about how it links to those themes that I, at the beginning that I showed you, we've got the character, well, we've got Frankenstein here, we've got the monster, the creature here in this scene. Lots we can say, especially about how Frankenstein thinks it's coming to attack him, and perhaps actually what it's doing is just asking for help, and the different perspectives on that tells us about the characters then we've obviously got our gothic setting in terms of our themes we've got the power danger of knowledge and this idea of monstrosity the descriptions of this creature as it comes to life and how monstrous it is when we can obviously make that higher grade argument that the only monster is victor not the creature but the creature has those descriptions of it being monstrous. So then we can go to writer's purpose. And again, these are our top grade, seven pluses. We wanna be thinking about, okay, she's trying to teach us about science here. At this time, people were afraid of science and scientists. We're afraid of things that we don't know. So for a scientist to go away and create life, to do something that is God's work and duty is horrific very unheard of she was very brave to do it um so we have this idea of fear of science fear of an industrial revolution the fear of change as as our life is changing and evolving and if we extend that further that we can then think about actually we've got victor who's the scientist and he's presented as very frantic very obsessive and very irresponsible and there's a bigger message there that you could make the argument about the character, linking that to the themes of power, danger of knowledge, linking that to the context of what scientists, what, what she's saying about scientists here. And again, it's those linking ideas together, drawing information. I've only got one tiny quote that I've learned, and I've got all of that that I can say about it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how we read literature text, or how I read literature text, to make sure that we're getting those grades that we really deserve. And we're there, we're done. I'm not gonna keep going, that is long enough. I hope you have enjoyed my little reading of Frankenstein. As always, like, subscribe, share, tell your friends, do your thing. And please, if there's something that you would like to know, something that you want me to read, something you'd like me to go through, especially for your literature texts, send me a message and I'll see what I can do. Hope to see you for the next video. Have a good day.